Well, thank you very much for joining us on the show. Just want to- No worries. Right... Oh, I'm a big sorry. fan. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, just to get right into it, tell me how you got this scoop about the first interview with a Glenn Maxwell juror. So um, it's a funny story, actually. I'd been posting a lot about the Maxwell trial on Twitter, obviously, and also on my Instagram. And there's a huge amount of interest in this case on Instagram in particular. And so I had a lot of people messaging me about it. And I, I got a lot of messages that were just links to some documents uh, that people wanted me to see. And then one of these messages was just a link to Scotty's profile. Mm. Um, this was someone who knows him personally uh, and knew that I was covering the case and thought that we should be in touch. And they didn't say anything in the message. They just sent me his profile um, and allowed me to kind of work out who he was. Uh, and then I messaged him and we went back and forth a lot and he had to get sign off from his employer to speak to the media. And so he just said, you know, look, I'll be in touch uh, once I've spoken to them. And I know he was getting messages from a lot of people, a lot of journalists. Um, and he said, you know, look, I've got everyone trying to interview me. I just need to talk to my employers. And I just said, yeah, great. Just let me know. And then he sent me a message as soon as he got signed off from his employers and he said I'd love to speak to you should we FaceTime and so we got on FaceTime so that I could confirm that he was someone that I recognized from the courtroom as being on the jury uh, and then we did an on the record interview and, and he was quite quite pleased about me being the first person he spoke to uh, and he said that you know he had a number of other people lined up that he was going to speak to afterwards. Uh, but of course, you know, I didn't know what he was going to say um, when we got on FaceTime. I assumed that we would talk about the evidence and the trial and his own reflections on the case, but I didn't know that he was going to talk to me about his personal experience with sexual abuse. Um, and so, as you can imagine, well, I mean, we spoke for three or four hours uh, and a lot of our conversation was about that um, because he, you know, he wanted to talk about that and he wanted to talk about what that meant in the jury room. Uh, and so then, of course, while I was in that conversation, I wrote to my editor and I said, just a heads up. So this was, I think it was like 2 a.m. in London. Um, and 9 p.m. in New York, and I wrote to my editor and I said, I just want to let you know this is this is what's happening in this interview. And obviously this is a big deal. Um, and they got legal on it straight away. Um, so then, and the lawyers spent a long time with it. And then obviously we published it the next day once the lawyers had signed off on it. And now the rest is history. Mm -hmm. So what was going through your mind when he started opening up and telling your story, telling his story and why, um, as he said in the uh, in the headline of your story, this is a verdict for all of the victims? Yeah, so, I mean, it was a really, really overwhelming interview for me because there were so many things going through my head. One of them was that it's incredibly powerful that he was choosing to share this story and that he was able to open up about what his history, his past history with abuse meant in terms of being a juror on this trial. But of course, I also knew, you know, I'm legally trained and I knew that, that this could be a huge issue. Um, and so, of course, I was immediately unsure what the right thing to do is. Uh, and I, I still am, you know, and, and I think I always will be because the last thing I would have ever wanted is to, you know, for us to be in a situation where there is a new trial and, and the victims have to go through this experience again. And, you know, I really... I feel, I feel very, very conflicted about whether that was the right thing to do. 
on the other hand, um, what I was thinking to myself that night was, you know, the only other option is not to publish it and to go back to him and say, I'm not going to publish this. Um, and, and I don't think that would have been the right decision either. So I, you know, from journalistically, I find it, I find it really, really difficult. Um, and it's, it's, it's just really, really tricky. And also, you know, the juror's best memory that night was that he filled in that form correctly and honestly. And I asked the court for a copy of that form so I could check, but of course it's under seal and, and they wouldn't give it to me. Um, and, you know, we don't, we still don't know what's on that form for sure um, until we have this inquiry and then until we can see the form with our own eyes. So, so I don't know what he put on there, but, but he believed that he had filled it in honestly. And, and if that's the case, then, then there is no problem here. But then, of course, you know, the next day um, after there were a bunch of follow up stories, um, he said that he wasn't sure. Um, and I advised him to contact the court at that point, uh, which is what he did. So to go back to your actual question, which is what was going through, lots of different things, um, lots of conflicting things. Ultimately, I thought that on balance, the right thing to do as a journalist would be to publish the story. Um, but as I said, you know, I think I'll always be unsure about that. It's a, it sounds like you're describing a strong degree of ambivalence being torn in both directions at the same time. Mm -hmm. Did the fact that there were two other news organizations that ran this story after uh, give you comfort that you did the right thing, that you were in fact doing your job as a journalist to tell the story and tell the truth. Yeah, it, you know, it, it did give me some, some degree of comfort um, knowing that he was interviewed by other reporters after me. Um, and this is, you know, it is really tricky because, because as a journalist, as you said, my job is to tell the truth. And I, and I don't think suppressing a story like this would have been the right thing to do as a journalist. Um, but I also have worked in law and obviously there was a part of me that, that felt really worried about the impact this would have on the courts. But then the other part of me, you know, having studied legal ethics and I, I also knew that if I was a lawyer in this case and I came across this information, I would have a duty to the court to disclose it. But, but then there's another instinct as a lawyer, which kind of tells you the opposite thing, which is that, that you don't want to interfere with the administration of justice. And then uh, I'm also an abuse survivor. You know, that's what both of the books I've written are about. Um, I grew up in a, in a similar situation to the Maxwell Epstein story. It's why I cover this case and it's why I'm so invested in it. And, and again, there are, there are two parts of, of that as well. One part of that version of me, the part that is a, a survivor of child sexual abuse, um, thought that it was important that Scott, Scotty wanted to tell his story. And I thought it was important for that to be done right and to be done sensitively. But then of course, the other part of me wants, you know, is really, really afraid of, of the impact this might have on other survivors and, and on Maxwell and Epstein's survivors if they have to go through another trial. Um, and so kind of in each, each of those roles, there was conflict. And ultimately I, you know, I spoke to editors and I spoke to a lot of mentors and, and ultimately, I was, I, you know, I did that interview in my role as a reporter and I think, and I decided that the, the right thing to do as a reporter was to publish it. Um, but yeah, I, ambivalence is exactly the right word, mm. as you can tell. Um, you mentioned uh, saying that you, 
uh, come at this with some personal history as well. Can you tell me about your book uh, that you published on this subject? Yeah, of course. So um, my first book was called I Choose Elena, uh, which is a memoir um, about my own abuse. So um, I was assaulted when I was a teenager, when I was 15, um, but I was also, uh, I grew up as a gymnast. I was a very serious gymnast. Uh, and I had a relationship that was sexually abusive um, with a powerful figure in, in the gymnastics world. And so my first book is about those two things. I didn't disclose um, either of those things until 10 years after um, my sexual assault separate to this relationship in the gymnastics setting. And the reason I didn't tell anyone was because I was deeply ashamed and I thought that I would be blamed for it. And I thought that people would think that I'd done something wrong. Um, and I didn't feel that I could tell anyone about it. And so I kept it to myself for 10 years. And in that time I got uh, very sick. I was in and out of hospital and was uh, have since been diagnosed with a couple of autoimmune disorders, which my doctors say is very closely linked to trauma and specifically sexual trauma. So. I wrote basically when I was kind of, when I first disclosed my abuse to, to my doctors, uh, I it then kind of opened up this whole world where uh, there was all this information about the long-term impacts of trauma that I had no idea about. And I had been a gender reporter. You know, I spent the first few years of my career reporting on sexual violence. And even I didn't know this, you know. And so it occurred to me that, that, that people should know. Um, just how trauma works and how it affects the body and how it affects the mind and how memory works and how difficult it is to recall traumatic memories with any degree of certitude because of the nature of the way that they're stored in the brain. So I'd been taking notes throughout this process um, and I decided to write a story about it and I was going to publish it anonymously. And then right at the last minute, I thought to myself, you know, if I now believe that I don't have to be ashamed of what happened to me, then I shouldn't be publishing this anonymously. You know, I, I need to act in a way that aligns with what I now believe, which is that there's nothing I could have changed about myself or my life to stop this from happening. The perpetrators are at fault, not me. So I published it under my own name and, and um, it got a lot of attention and, and that turned into a two book deal. Um, so the first book is called I Choose Elena. The second book is called My Body Keeps Your Secrets. And the second one is, is a, it's the same subject matter. It's all about trauma and memory, but it's based on interviews with 100 women, trans and non-binary people that I conducted about their own trauma, trauma and about their own memories. So the first book is kind of my own experience. It's quite narrow. Uh, the second book aims to turn that into a, a more journalistic project and uh, interview a bunch of people and, and pull together their stories um, in the hopes that one day we might be able to better understand how trauma really works. And so much of what you're describing and what you have described about your books echoes a lot of what we've heard both throughout the Glenn Maxwell trial uh, on memory and trauma and also what you quite vividly reported about Scotty David and the particular memories that manifested for him. Can you describe those moments when he is talking about his own personal experience in relation to the Maxwell trial? Yeah, I mean, it, it was really, um, it was really powerful to hear him speak about that because sometimes it feels like so few sections of society really understand how traumatic memory works. Um, and this fact that, that you and I heard in that courtroom from the, from the government when they were doing their closing arguments, which is that details, peripheral details in particular can become confused, can be mixed up, um, but that doesn't mean that you are any less certain that something happened. And that's how Scotty recounted his own memories of abuse, that he said, some things run together. Um, traumatic memories are really, really hard to recover clearly. Um, but the core of it 
I am so sure about. And that felt very important to me. Uh, that's how my own memories of abuse work. And it's what we heard from all the victims who testified in this trial. And, you know, I think wh while I really, you know, I would so hate it if this interview resulted in another trial. Um, I do think it's important to think about this very strong reaction that's come out since that story was published that it seems that so many people genuinely think that um, abuse victims shouldn't serve on juries for abuse cases. And um, I think we need to interrogate that because um, it, it's conflating a bunch of things. It's, it's basically saying that we think personal knowledge of something is the same as bias. Um, and certainly in other types of crimes, we don't make that assumption. So we're, we're putting, I, mean, I spoke to a, a jury expert about this on Friday, and it's just the idea of putting sexual abuse victims in a different category, this category of kind of incurable bias. Um, I think that's difficult. And uh, I think we need to look at that. And, and I hope that Judge Nathan does. You know, I hope that she reflects on this um, when she, if, if there is an inquiry and if she does rule on this issue, because, you know, Scotty said to me so many times, and I printed this in the story, that, that he genuinely believed Ghislaine Maxwell was innocent when he started that trial. And he took that duty so seriously. He said she was innocent until proven guilty, and I was not going to convict her unless there was enough evidence, documentary evidence, enough testimony. Um, and so, at least, you know, in his own words, it, it's not the case that, that he had a preconception of, of whether she had done this or not. Um, and he was persuaded by the evidence. And, you know, he did also disclose his own personal experience in the jury room. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't know that's, that that's the same as him being a biased juror. And so I think it's important that we look at that. And also I think, you know, the, the prosecution didn't give the jury a memory expert. You know, they didn't have someone uh, who squarely said, this is how traumatic memories are stored. This is how traumatic memories are retrieved. This is why it can be difficult for victims to uh, place things with certainty in time and place. And so the jurors, the now three jurors who said that they discussed their abuse in that jury room were doing something that I think a prosecution expert witness should have done for the jury, which was explain how these things work. And we didn't have that. So, you know, I think there are a lot of questions that are thrown up about mm. this, this idea that these three jurors shared their experience and, and whether or not that helped other people in the jury understand how these memories work. Um, and certainly for me, hearing that from him in that interview, as someone who's um, been researching and reporting on traumatic memory for a long time, uh, it felt very significant. Um, so, yeah. And as you mentioned, since the publication of your story and the publication of the other interviews with Scotty David, more jurors have come forward and said that uh, there's been uh, other reports that uh, there was at least another juror who was a survivor of sexual abuse. And it's very interesting. I've been monitoring that docket pretty closely and nothing has happened since those particular stories. It seems mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, it, it seems likely perhaps that other jurors disclosed their history of sexual abuse and they were impaneled and the uh, yeah. Glenn Maxwell's defense uh, had no grounds to challenge anything because that was disclosed. Can you uh, talk about the significance of that? Because as you said, a lot of people have taken away from this that uh, somehow sexual abuse survivors uh, are not fit to serve on juries. And that's the absolute wrong lesson to take away. Totally. And, and the way you just phrased it is exactly right. You know, now we have three people who've gone to the press to say that they had um, had these experiences in their lives and we haven't had any movement on the docket in relation to those people. Um, so perhaps it is the case that they disclosed that on their juror questionnaires and were impaneled anyway. And if you look at the case law, 
that is the most likely outcome if those people didn't say or didn't give any answers which suggested they couldn't overcome uh, any bias that that experience left them with. So it's certainly not the case that the defence has this right to just strike any person who's ever been abused from their jury. And I think it's likely, as you say, that, that in fact, in this case, there were one or maybe two jurors who did disclose it and who they couldn't get off the jury. And that's because um, it's not the court's view that sexual abuse survivors are not fit to serve on juries for these cases. The question they ask sexual abuse survivors is, can you put that to one side and assess the evidence? And if the answer to that is yes, and the court believes that in, in voir dire, in hearing that answer, then that juror would be impaneled. So I think, I think that's important, as you say, that the lesson we take away isn't that um, it's right to think that sexual abuse survivors shouldn't be on those kinds of juries. Um, because, because that's not the law. And also, if it were the law, I think that would be a really big problem. Especially if you think about that question, um, it's incredibly broadly worded. You know, that question is, is very broad. It says, have you ever been sexually abused, assaulted or harassed? Or has a friend or family member been sexually abused, assaulted or harassed? And when you include sexual harassment in that question, um, based on the latest statistics that I've been able to find, 81% of women say they've been sexually harassed. Mm. That leaves 19% of women who can say no to that question. Um, plus, then you add the, has a friend or family member ever been sexually harassed? So, you know, it's about 43% of men who say they've been abused or harassed. Then you add the men who have a friend or family member who is a woman and who has been sexually harassed. That's a huge chunk of the population. And in fact, you know, statistically, it would be surprising if if most of the jury could say no to that question, because it is so it is so the, it, on its terms, it is so broad. Mm. So, you know, I think that's an interesting thing for us to look at is um, how many people really can say no to that. Mm. Um, and so it's important to understand that that if you say yes to that question, you're not automatically excluded from the jury. It's only if you say yes to that question and the judge is convinced that that experience is so dominant that uh, you would automatically convict anyone accused of sexual abuse, um, which certainly wouldn't be the case for most abuse survivors. Um, and, you know, as I think it was Julie who pointed out um, that, abuse survivors who have lived experience and know how memory works would arguably be better at assessing both cases. You know, if they thought a witness wasn't telling the truth about a traumatic memory, they would probably be very well equipped to assess that rather than this idea that they would just automatically believe any story about sexual abuse and convict any person who'd been accused of it. So, you know, I think, I think we really need to look at that and be clear about what the law is here, that it, you know, it's not the case that if someone had a past experience that that they should have been excluded from that jury. And, and I think we really need to resist that, um, that narrative because the people that would be left on the jury, if you were to say the law is that you can't serve on, on this kind of jury if you've had this experience or know anyone who has this experience, the jury would look a lot more like Jeffrey Epstein than it would look like the victims of Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, because you'd be, you'd only be impaneling people who had never been affected by gender-based violence or harassment, and that would be a problem too. Right. I think you raise a good point that beyond being a kind of problem in principle and ethics, it raises a practical concern once you kind of look at the numbers and the percentages. In making the decision to run with the story, have you experienced any public blowback? Yes. <laughs> what has that been like? Um, it's really hard. As I said, um, given that that I felt conflicted about it anyway, um, of course, I internalized a lot of this feedback um, because I felt unsure if it was the right decision. Um, and so I, I find it very difficult, especially, of course, 
you know, being a survivor myself and, and having uh, spent most of my journalistic career writing about these issues and, and trying to be a journalistic advocate for victims, of course, you know, the feedback that uh, centers around what the fact that my actions might have caused um, further hardship for victims, I find that very difficult because that's, that's the last thing I want. Um, and these victims deserve closure and finality and uh, justice. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't want this interview and Scotty's story to, to have, to end up prolonging this process for them. So that I find really difficult. You know, it's, I think it's, because I've been reporting on sexual violence for a long time, I get, a, I've always had a lot of this kind of thing. I get a lot of um, hate on the internet. Um, mm -hmm. But this is, of course, because um, a lot of criticism is is coming from from people who are advocating for victims and and that um, is really difficult for me because I, I I would have never intended that outcome and I, and I really don't want that to happen so uh, you know I, I I as I said I still feel conf conflicted and and I think the, the questions around the ethics of this are important too, and, and that feedback is important, and I take it on board. For what it's worth, as a US-based journalist, uh, it seems to me that the journalistic ethics of going with this story are very clear cut. You have the right to report what a juror says, and that this is a crucial function of journalists in the United States to share those stories into the jury process. Uh, you are in London. Uh, can you describe yes. the difference between the two systems, how in the United States, it is not only fair game, but one of the sacred du duties of journalism to describe this process, and in the UK, you cannot speak to jurors and which system do you think um what are the advantages and drawbacks of both systems that is a fantastic question and it is very interesting for me um to kind of reflect on this because because the rules are so different as you said in the u.s um journalists are allowed to speak to jurors and a lot of um the US journalists who cover trials like these uh, mentors that I have, who I called saying, oh my God, I have no idea what to do. Um, they said, you know, we need to know about this process. That's your job. You, you know, you can't cover up information about this process. If you're scared, um, that would make you a very bad journalist. Uh, and the whole point of allowing jurors to speak to journalists is that we want to know how this process works. We want transparency, we need transparency. Um, and if there's something to be addressed, we want to be able to address it. We don't want journalists to be covering it up so that we don't have those conversations. But then of course in the UK and in Australia, which is where I trained as a lawyer, um, journalists are not allowed to speak to jurors ever at any stage. Um, so the story reads very differently in those contexts. Um, and a lot of people don't know that jurors are allowed to speak to the media in the US. Um, so it was more of a surprise, I think, uh, in the UK, especially because I published this story in, in a UK newspaper. Um, so people were surprised that this was allowed. Um, but equally, there's, there's another interesting conversation about this questionnaire, because in the UK, jurors are not asked anything about their own lives before they're impaneled. They're not allowed to be asked anything. So jurors' privacy is kind of complete in the UK they are picked completely randomly. So no one is screened, no one is asked, have you ever been abused? Nothing like that. So, you know, that, that difference um, makes a huge difference as to how, in terms of how people are responding to the story as well, because in the UK, I, I spoke to one um, expert on the jury system on Friday, who's in the US and one who's in the UK. And the expert I spoke to in the UK said, to us, you know, it just, it feels shocking that they would even be asked this question uh, before being allowed on a jury. And so to UK lawyers, um, 
and citizens, this this backlash that says Scottish shouldn't have been on the jury because he'd been abused is completely alien to the UK because no one would ever be asked that question. Um, so it really highlights just how different these systems are. And, you know, the, the principles behind them are completely, completely different. And in terms of the pros and cons, you know, I think it's difficult. Um, I, I do really think it's important that we know what happens in jury rooms. Um, I think it's important to the administration of justice um, more generally that there is an avenue for, for, for there to be some transparency about that. So that when things do go wrong, uh, we know about it and the and convictions or acquittals can't be left standing when something uh, happened in the jury room that the court should put, should review. And of course, in the UK and Australia, uh, you would never know the, the court would never know unless a lawyer found out about something and then they would have a duty to disclose to the court. So I think um, overall, I think I think it is better for, for jurors to be allowed to speak to the press. Um, so that we can review that process and so that there's there's not a kind of um, black box of the jury room that, that we can never interrogate as journalists and therefore as a society. Um, but of course, it, it means that it, it's trickier when, when a jurist does say something to the press that then has to be re reviewed by the court, which is the situation that we're in now. So there's definitely benefits to both. Um, if I had to go one way or the other, I, I do think it's better that jurors are allowed to speak to the press. Mm. But of course, especially right now, I understand why people have reservations about it. Mm. Um, even setting aside the specific facts of the Glenn Maxwell case, and we still have a way to go with that. This is going to, it's about a month before we find out whether there will even be an inquiry, there will be briefing on that. This is, you know, so far as we know, the convictions stand, but setting all that aside, doesn't what you're describing go to the accountability function of the press that even jurors, and I'm not saying that there was misconduct on this, a court will determine that, but we, we don't want jury misconduct. And the only safeguard exactly. against it is a free and unfettered press that can ask questions to jurors. Exactly. And I, you know, I think that's right. And I think, as you say, outside of the specific facts of this case, um, the, the principle of it, I think, is important. The principle that there is accountability around the jury system. Uh, and that, as you say, if something went wrong, either in the screening process or in deliberations, which um, we don't know if that happened here, that the court will determine that, as you said. Um, but if if it did happen, and you can imagine situations that are um, more extreme than this, and you know, if that does happen, we, I really do think it's important that we can look at that. Um, and I, I, you know, I think it contributes to accountability and fairness. And, and we know as people who've covered the criminal justice system that um, there are a lot of chances for things to go wrong in this process. Um, and, you know, it, it's not a perfect or even a good system, I don't think. And so I think the more chances we have to um, review how it works, whether it's working properly, whether there are things that we need to change, you know, I think that's important. Like, for example, with these um, three jurors who've said that they had been sexually abused, if we don't, we don't know what they put on their forms, if it is the case that um, two, or, two or more of them didn't disclose, then maybe we need to look at that questionnaire and we need to think, you know, is this question clear? It, should we be putting that, that very uh, sensitive question in amongst a, a lot of other questions that are not necessarily of that nature? Should we be asking jurors in a different context? Um, should we be asking that question at all? You know, that those kind of things are important and and if we didn't know what had happened, what, what was happening in jury rooms, then we wouldn't be able to review those processes and those procedures. And I do think it's important to do that. And um, I do think it's important that we have a chance to do that. Whereas in the UK and Australia, there is this kind of um, sacred space that can never, ever, ever be reviewed or interrogated. And so we just never know what happens. And, and we never know how 12 people reach a verdict. 
thank you so much for sharing your time and experience and talking about this on the show. No worries. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.